pick up now at the end of chapter 3, the final one of the seven churches that Jesus addressed to open the book that we call Revelation. We've got nine verses to read, so without further ado, let's read the Word of God. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The title of my message this morning is Your Spiritual AAA Recovery Service, an Accurate Assessment. Let's pray. Father, we pray for two miracles. First, the miracle of speech, that you would enable me to speak the words that Jesus would speak if he was standing here today. That will require a miracle, but I present myself for that purpose. And then we pray for the miracle of hearing. and We present ourselves for that purpose, that one message would touch many hearts, but you would enable us to hear and walk away and say, there was something in there for me. So we present ourselves for both of those miracles, trusting that you will do what you've always done, for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we delve into God's Word, may the Lord be with you. I, I, I trust I'm going to have some opportunities down the road to make some more statements about Revelation. But let's just, the point I want you to remember today is Jesus requires that you always have an accurate assessment of your spiritual condition, and that assessment must be confessed and addressed. Our first point is that Laodicea is the last church to be addressed. Jesus has nothing much good to say about this church. Now, I find it interesting. Well, I find all the Bible interesting. But the way Revelation is laid out is that the, 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 the revelation is given to local churches, and it starts out with Jesus addressing the spiritual condition of those churches. So this was never intended to be a book that was in the stratosphere that was beyond our comprehension. And one of the keys of interpreting Revelation, one of them, is to try and understand what Revelation would have meant to the churches that it was sent to. Because if it was just a book that was sent to say what's going to happen in 2,000 years with Russia and Iran, that makes no sense. And so to make sure we don't miss that, the Spirit, Jesus starts the book with very practical indictments or commendations for seven particular churches. Now, the Revelation is not about the Antichrist. We don't care who the Antichrist is. I had a man who came up to me in New Jersey and said, Pastor, pray for me. I think I'm married to the Antichrist. And, and <laughs> I said, you could be. I, I don't know. I don't, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not spiritually discerning enough. But the, it's a book about the Christ. It, if, if there's any metaphor, and there are many that we could apply to Revelation, it is Jesus, the boxer, who is standing in the ring. And generation after generation, many challengers come to try and mar or take away from his lordship and his sovereignty. But he is still winner and champion. Amen. In my book, I say every ism, in the presence of Christ, ultimately becomes a wasm. <laughs> Mohammedism, Buddhism, Hinduism, capitalism, materialism, communism, existentialism. None of them can stand up to the breath and the scrutiny that would come from God's mouth and his mind. Jesus is winner and still champion. That, and any message that does not promote that ultimate conclusion is bogus. 
Why would the first 65 books of the Bible be so uplifting and so exalting of the name of the Lord Jesus and the 66 book come along to bring confusion and fear? Makes no sense. But apocalyptic literature, which Revelation is a part of, has its own rules that govern its interpretation. Just like science fiction would have. When you enter into science fiction, you have a set of rules and expectations. When you read satire, you, you have rules and expectations. And we have gone in to Revelation armed with certain rules and regulations that were never meant to apply. Consequently, we've come up with some really zany conclusions. But this revelation first came and rested upon the foundation and the authority of the local church through the apostolic leadership. See, somebody didn't like what I said. I offend people all the time. This always happens. Yeah, did you pin, you pinched that baby, didn't you? You did. And when you preach, I am so cooperative. And you... Jesus told the church he wished they were hot or cold but they had rendered themselves useless due to their lukewarm approach to spirituality. Now, everything in us wants to approach lukewarm as middle of the road, as compromising, as not all in and not all out. That's not the meaning here. You see, Laodicea was a, a, a city that was located by uh, some water sources. One of the water sources were hot springs. And so... People would go, Romans would come from all over the empire, and they would take advantage of these hot springs. But when they tried to bring the hot springs, and Romans could move water through the aqueduct system, when they tried to bring the hot springs to Laodicea, by the time they arrived, they were lukewarm. Now, also close by, there, were some, uh, there was a water source that was very cold and refreshing. And so when they tried to bring that water over the, 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 the technology that they had to deliver the water. By the time it got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. So this is not a message about mediocrity. This is, this is a message about ineffectiveness. And Jesus was saying, you're no, you are of no use to me where you are right now. And, and, be, and, and, it's, I'm gonna, and it's a graphic of, of image of him spitting something out of his mouth. So it's not a, well, you know, it's, 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 you, I'm, I've got tepid Christianity. No. If you're tepid, you're not effective. It's either you're, you're effective or you're not. Now, they saw themselves as having it all together, while in reality they are spiritually poor, naked, and blind. Now, again, Jesus was addressing this local church. This was not bizarre revelation. This was practical evaluation. And he tells them, you, you think you got it together, you don't. And what I would recommend is that you get gold, clothes, and ISAV from me. Now, they were a banking center, so they understood the gold. And this was a prosperous area, so they were, they, they were probably taking great pride in, the, in their commerce and their ability of what they could do. It was a textile area. They, their, their sheep produced black wool, so they produced uh, clothing that was unique, and so they, <coughs> they were used to talking about clothing. So Jesus was talking them to them in terms they could understand. But he said, you're really naked. And then ISAV, there was a medical school there, so they, they probably treated eye ailments and... Maybe it had some success, but Jesus was saying in a spiritual sense, you, 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 you're not, you're blind. How many times did Jesus open the eyes of the blind? How many, how many times in Scripture does God open the eyes of people to see what was right in front of them, but they could not see because of their preconceived notions or their spiritual condition? Why is it so difficult for me to acknowledge the reality of who I am? Why do I immediately go into defensiveness, victim mentality, and excuse making? We were talking about this in staff preparation this week, and we briefly discussed Genesis 3. 
the fall of Adam and Eve. And immediately when Adam and Eve fall, what do they do? They try to cover themselves. They go hiding from God. There was blame shifting even among Adam and Eve and the serpent. And, and, and so we are their children. Last year somebody came, dressed me down pretty good, said I'm self-promoting and other things. and You know, everything in you wants... And, and, but I said, God, help me to say thank you for taking the time to share. I don't see that but I'm not above or below what you're saying. And so I promise you I will address that and take it to the Lord. And again, I want to thank you for coming, and now I want you to leave <laughs> and take all sharp objects with you. When I used to do couples counseling and we have such a fabulous counseling department, I, I don't have to do much of that anymore. But when I'd have couples come, and, and they were, I mean, we'd have to disarm them. We'd have to have a metal detector, you know, and leave all your grenades, knives, you know, uh, automatic weapons, just leave them and come into the office. And they come in loaded still. And I'd say, before we go on, what I would like you to do, and I'd do this for each partner, I'd say, I would want you now to tell me what I'm going to hear from your partner about you. And then we're going to give the other partner a turn. And, and they would say, well, he's probably going to say that I put the kids before him, but he never helps me. I said, no, 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 you can't. I, I don't want to hear about him. I am just want to hear what he's going to say about you. I want to hear what she's going to say about you. Do you put work before? Well, I, somebody has to put I didn't ask you, do you? It's hard. It's hard. And sometimes we can't even see it. You know, it, in our house, we called it a sorry butt. We'd, we'd say, that's a sorry butt. And in our house, a sorry butt was this. When we confronted a problem, someone would say, I'm sorry butt. See, if you say, I'm sorry butt, you ain't sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm tired. He doesn't clean up his room either. I said, I'm sorry, but he's always, she's always talking to him. I said, but then you're not sorry. You're, you're justifying your lousy behavior in the context of somebody else's lousy behavior. It's the, the victim mentality. If you, you know, if you wouldn't have been there, my fist wouldn't have hit your jaw. <laughs> so in some sense, it's your fault. We got a lot of sorry butts in here. <laughs> it's hard not to. But their only road to recovery, and yours too, is to come to Jesus and confess their condition. In other words, they needed an accurate assessment. See, when you break down, that's not the time to rise up and defend, that's the time to lay low and humble yourself and ask God for his help. It's their road to recovery, and it's yours and my road too. See, the self-awareness, the ability to see ourselves as best we can for who we are and who we're not. And it's a whole other message for us to have an accurate assessment of who we are, the gifts we have, the things we can do. We are a tormented group. We're a tormented race. But Jesus came to set free from our torment. You know, about a month ago when Pastor Rock was ministering one of the messages and at the end he said, now let's take some time and ask the Lord, is there anything you need to repent of? I mean, I, I've got five big ones that I know God's going to nail me on. I mean, mouth, mind, ears, you know, eyes. It's got to be one of those. I position myself and this question comes across my mind, why are you so afraid? And I immediately knew the fear had been keeping me from doing things God wanted me to do. See, one of the ways you can be self-aware is you ask good questions. <laughs> 
And that's so I, I, I take out of, I, I, was, I was in Dallas and I had been working with the church for 18 months as a consultant and they let me go and they let me have it when they let me go. And everything in me wanted to point out what I had done and the dysfunction that was there and what had happened. I said, I, I ask your forgiveness that I could not meet your expectations at this moment. And I walked away. See, we can't even pick and choose the things that we want to deal with. You've heard me say, I've done prison ministry. In prison, everybody wants to quit cussing, quit smoking, and read their Bible more. Isn't it amazing God never deals with racism? God never deals with spousal abuse. God never deals with child abandonment. God never deals with hatred. Because we're afraid. We're afraid if we go there. Like our parents, Adam and Eve, were afraid that God's going to get us. But brothers and sisters, if God were going to get you, you'd already be gotten. Amen. You've given God enough reasons. Hello. I heard, heard R.C. Sproul say once, God doesn't have to give you a second chance when you sin the first time. Amen. As young as you may be. But it's It's tough. Jesus said they must purchase gold, clothes, and eye salve, but they had nothing with which to make a deal. That's our dilemma. We have nothing that God needs, nothing that we can do to merit the exchange because the exchange is priceless. Of course, the good news is that Jesus paid the price, <clears throat> almost all of it. Don't panic. I'll explain that in a minute. See, many people take Revelation, and we have been trained by fiction and teaching to take Revelation and point it to the future. And that's, that's a mistake. Much of Revelation is pointing to the past, the other books of the Bible, to show that everything that God promised has been fulfilled in Christ. Now, there are future implications, as I mentioned to you earlier. But Iran's not in the Bible. How many tanks they have? It's not in the Bible. Don't tell me that would have meant anything to Laodicea. But this meant something. And what was described for the next 19 chapters after that meant something for their spiritual wherewithal and benefit. So Isaiah 55.1 says, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. So that's just a clue that we see something in Revelation that jogs our memory of some, something that was in the Old Testament. So it doesn't take us back, forward, it takes us back to put our trust on the foundation of God's goodness and God's promises. Someone had to pay the price for our gold, for our covering, for our holiness, for our ability to see, and it was Christ. And he not only takes on all comers and defeats them who try and oppose them, but he takes on all comers who humble themselves and acknowledge their need in him. And he said, Father, not one will I lose. You realize how many that is? What a, what a boast that is. I've got the power to preserve in me everyone now and in the future, who comes to me, and that includes you and me. He never runs out. But you've got to acknowledge your need. <laughs> your honesty and transparency before God is the price that you must pay. I told you Jesus paid almost all the price. The price you've got to pay is honesty and transparency. Again, a couple that uh, years ago, I heard the story, they were really fussing, they were really having struggles, and the mother, mother-in-law was there living with them for a while. She was trying to help them, and one night they had an intense session. She went to bed. They continued the intense fellowship that they had been having. She came downstairs a little bit later, said, I just fell asleep. I had a dream. I saw a funeral home. I saw the two of you there sitting in caskets, but both of you refused to lay down. Some of you are sitting up in your casket. You are refusing to die to your perspective of your past. Yes, your mother did pinch you with the pins with which she changed your diapers. 
and you do need healing. I am not making fun of that. But ultimately, you still have to accept moral responsibility for the decisions that you've made. And while we deal with that, we deal with it not in a victimization mentality, but in a mentality of personal responsibility. Lord, show me my role in this. Because I'm sure I have one. I can't see it, but I'm sure it's there. Why, if we did that, churches would stay together. Marriages would stay together. Families would be reconciled. And that's what Jesus is, the key he's trying to give to Laodicea. So in this honesty, again, it's not just with God. Sometimes it's with one another. Now, your accurate assessment, your AAA recovery service, and this is, again, another fear that we have of why we don't do it, does not disqualify you from God's favor and fellowship. In fact, if anything, the context here of Jesus saying, I'm knocking, if you'll open the door, if you'll open the door to my perspective and accept it, and we can be in agreement, I mean, I almost named the message, let's party. Because once you get this done, Jesus comes in and said, where's the groceries? When do we eat? And you say, oh, no, Lord, you don't understand. Oh, forget that. You've already told me. I've already forgiven you. Now, let, let's fellowship. Doesn't disqualify you. Now, my, my, my story I want to tell, and it, it, I was raised Catholic, and this is just a story. Don't send me any emails, all right? I just, <laughs> my father would, would, and we went to a church here on the north side, and he said one night, he, he wanted to go to confession. He said, these were his words he gave me. He had a particularly juicy confession. And so, you know, when I mean, you would go, there would be a confessional booth, but this, they, the church was under renovations, and the confession had to happen face to face. So the priest was in a room, and he was sitting, and he would have been facing over here. My dad said he came in. He said the room was dim, but it was still lit. And he knew the priest, and my dad's name was John. I named after him. So he said there were two chairs by the priest. He took the one that was behind him so he couldn't see him. And he said he disguised his voice. My sweet father, I send it. He said he slurred his words. They went through the procedure, and if you're familiar, at the end, the priest prays, you say your act of contrition, and, as my, and he said, now my son, go in peace. When my father get up to go, he said, by the way, John, would you mail this letter on your way out? <laughs> he said, Ugh. But see, his confession didn't disqualify him. It's been amazing to me how sometimes I come to the Lord, I blew it. I, Lord, I just... I, put me on the shelf, and he sends me on. Elijah, just, just despairing, doubting, depression. And, and God said, you're not the only one. Now get up. I got, you got a king you got to anoint. You got to anoint your, your, your successor. And you want to say, but he's not in the right condition. He wasn't doing. Yeah, he was. He had an accurate assessment. And that enabled God to use him. Point A, Jesus was and still is a friend of sinners. Now, let me be clear. I am not using this to justify any sin. There are consequences. You rob a bank and you confess it to Jesus, he'll forgive you, but you still may do 10 to 20. <laughs> but when you go, Jesus will go with you. I did enough prison ministry. I was always amazed at the presence of God's grace in the men's and women's prisons that I would go to. There were still repercussions, but the fellowship was pure. It was rich, and the love of God was poured out. Jesus is the friend of sinners. And if you deny your sin, he can't be your friend. So you've got two choices. You can stand in your self-righteousness and try to make a case of why you're not as bad as, as, as circumstances may be pointed to, or you can go over and side with Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm a mess. And he said, I know. Let's go get something to eat. <laughs> Thanks for opening the door. But finally, your spiritual need is not to be a morbid focus. <clears throat> I mean, some people, some believers' theme song is the song out of the Wizard of Oz where... They're about to go into the palace at the end, and the guards are singing, oh, yo, yo, 
Yo, yo, yo, I'm a sinner. Oh, God could never use me. Stop it. <clears throat> We've got to walk in this tension of recognizing our need, but realizing we are seated in high places. That it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. While I acknowledge my weakness, while I acknowledge my failure, my, while I acknowledge my moral ineptitude, I also acknowledge the sovereignty and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain and sits upon the throne. Amen. And no plague, no trumpet, no horse, nothing will touch me unless he wants it to. And if it costs me my life, I still win. I can't lose. And the promise for this church at the end is if you will overcome, I will make you victorious like I am victorious and I'm seated on the throne. See, the, the, the obstacle to your fellowship with Jesus is not your honesty. It's your entree. It's the foundation. And maybe there's a password that Jesus wants to hear as he's coming in, kind of a reverse password. We knock, he knocks, we open. He says, what's the password? We say needy. He says, let's eat. When you break down your spiritual AAA service is an accurate assessment. That doesn't run God off. It brings him to you. Because Jesus requires that you always have an accurate assessment of your spiritual condition, and that assessment must be confessed and addressed. Let's bow our heads. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never made the most basic of assessments, an acknowledgement that you can't do this, any of this, on your own. Your life's a mess. You've tried and tried. You've even made commitments to say, well, I'll stop smoking, then I'll go to church. I'll, I'll get my marriage straight, then I'll go to church. And it hasn't worked. It can't work. Because you have to come to God, and then he'll help you fix those other things. Because he'll fix you. That's what we call making a commitment to the Lord Jesus. There's some of you here, people have been praying for you. You're not here by accident. You're here because God brought you here to hear this message. So if that's you, and you've never made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants to make the transaction today to come in and fellowship with you. You make the assessment and say, I need you, and he'll come. If that's you, raise your hand where you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the balcony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now you hold on. I'm going to pray for another group, and then we're going to, I'm going to pray for both of you together. I'm going to call for another. Now you know the Lord. But you've been living in the victim mentality. You've been living in a, in a massive defensiveness that it does not allow you to receive the truth from anyone, including God. And you've broken down, and you need to make a AAA call today by acknowledging this is who I am. If that's you, raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Yes, yes. It's between you and the Lord. You won't impress me if you raise your hand. You won't impress me if you don't. All right, let me pray for both groups now. Just Everybody pray with me. Father, for that first group, you did this for every one of us who are here, Lord. You, you met us more than halfway. You took us at our neediest point, and you transformed us into sons and daughters of the King. Now, for that first group, Lord, I pray that you'll do the same thing today. I pray that you will seal their decision with your presence, that you will carry them on eagle's wings and take them to a place where they understand your goodness, your mercy in the midst of their need. But Lord, for the second group, those of us who know you, Lord, we ask your forgiveness. We, we've been at odds with you because we haven't been fighting some other perspective. We've been fighting your perspective. We've been making excuses. We've been running. And all you want us to do is open the door and say, I need you. So for those who raise their hands, first and second group, we are saying, I need you. If you raised your hand, just say it softly. I need you. I need you. And Lord, we need you. For those of us that didn't raise our hands, we're one word, one act, one deed away from the person next to us who raised their hand. Because we need you too, Lord. And all of us together proclaim our neediness as a body, as a church. But we don't want to stay there, Lord. 
We want to make room for your abundant provision to make us the fullest, best expression of who you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's